Hey everybody, Matt Gurney here, Jen Gerson back with me, still picking up the pieces after a pretty wild couple of weeks in the news. We're going to be talking about what's happening south of the border and also a really interesting lesson from south of the border that we think ought to be taken seriously here. We're going to give you something that we're going to have to really depressingly call the anti-Semitism roundup because boy, it's been a week for that. And to finish, just don't ruin Remembrance Day. That shouldn't be that hard. All this and more on the latest episode of The Line Podcast. This episode of The Line Podcast has been brought to you by Unsmoke Canada. Canada can be a global leader in reducing the harm caused by smoking, but it requires actionable steps, including giving adult smokers the information they need to choose potentially less harmful alternatives. Learn more at unsmoke.ca. So, Jen, this was an interesting week. It has been an absolute tsunami of news. The old joke, it feels like drinking from a fire hose. But on the other hand, not that much happened because it's all the same stuff. Every day, there's been some new announcement of a new Trump official. Every day, there's been some new reaction of some kind from a Canadian politician. But... At the end of a week, and we're recording this at a normal time on Friday, the end of the week, I don't feel like that much has happened. And I know like a lot's happened, but it all feels same, same to me. Where, where are you kind of in your processing of all of this at the end of the week? Well, the thing that I just, my major takeaway, particularly from watching the news um, down in the U.S., we're going to get into the fine grain detail of a little bit uh, of it a bit without repeating what has been repeated at length by American outlets, I think. But the thing that I just have to remind myself and remind our viewers and listeners about is that the circus is the point. Yeah. The, the purpose of the exercise is to throw so much shit into the stream that you are can't over the that you can't see the bottom anymore. You were overwhelmed, and that that, that particular point particularly came back to me when um, the some of the news about the appointments, particularly around Matt Gates. Mm-hmm. Do we need to get For into Attorney an explanation yeah. of Matt Gates? Matt Gates, who is you know under allegations, credible allegations that he has had sex with underage, at least one underage um, uh, woman, and may, maybe more very serious allegations of yeah, that nature. The, at least one qualifier is a sign things are never going your way. Yeah, exactly. Um, of course, now Attorney General of the very departments that were tasked with overseeing his his investigation into those allegations. I mean, this is totally once again enveloped the American political discourse, right? In exactly the same way that everything that Trump does completely overwhelms and envelops the American discourse because it's yeah. there, every day there's a, they couldn't, they couldn't, I can't believe it, you know, rending of the veils, tearing of the hair. Um, and, and every single time what I will collectively and probably erroneously call the media falls for it. We fall for the, the same thing over and over and over again. The circus is the point. The chaos is the point. These appointments are designed to trigger the right people, right? I mean, the, the fact that he's ethically unqualified for that position is he wasn't appointed to that role despite that fact. He was appointed to that role because of that fact. Yeah. Same thing with the Fox News nobody Trump loyalist who was appointed to the head of or or is it going to be appointed to the head of defense according to Department of Defense, I believe, yes? Has Hegeth or Hegseth, Hegeth, whatever. Yeah. It's like, yes, no, he's woefully unqualified for that position. That's not a that's not a bug, that's a feature. Eh? Um we're gonna talk about a little bit about Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard. Well when your own colleagues are wondering aloud if you're a Russian agent. I think they've gone beyond wondering aloud. I think that there have been several, even on the Republican side, people who are saying this person is not qualified because there is there is significant reason to believe that she may be a Russian asset. Maybe not the head of, you know, national security. I, I, you know, just a thought, you know, just a thought. Just um, putting that out there. Just putting that out there. Um, but no, I mean, this is, this is, this is going to be repeated by people who are more informed and more on the ground in America at length. And I don't think that we have the resources or the capacity to compete with a lot of that, with that reporting. So I will leave it to our readers to get into that, 
with the appropriate sources. But I just want to rem- remind people that, look, th- that whether or not these people actually pass a confirmation process or not, or whether or not Trump tries to circumvent a, a legitimate confirmation process to put them into place, they're being put into place because they're unqualified, because they're they're suspect, because they're nuts. They're being put because into place. MSNBC because MSNBC will hate it. Because MSNBC will hate it, and it's about and it's about cementing and 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 cementing Trump's absolute unquestioned authority over the pro- yeah. the, the 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 country and the and the party that he's operating in. And if you hate it, and if you react, and if it's a circus and it's a giant mess, that is also the point. That circus is designed to desensitize you from the actual power moves that are going on beneath the surface. So that's my takeaway from from a lot of the stuff. I do want to talk about one of these appointments because I think it is um, pertinent to Canada in specifically. Sure. Um, I, I, I have a whole tangent to go on, but why don't you... But wh- kind of, wh- no, go, go on the tangent first and then we'll circle back to the Canadian specific you know what, no, you want, Honestly, go ahead. Like, first of all, ladies first, but also probably it makes more sense to do yours now because mine might take us a ways afield. Sure. Okay. So one of the appointments, no, not all of Trump's appointments have been crazy or inappropriate. That's the other Some thing I would Some of them have been really out. bad. Some of them have been fine. Some of them have been fine. Some of them I think yeah. have even been potentially very good. So it's not like you can say that Trump is going crazy all the way down. I think we have to be balanced and fair in our in our approach to examining some of these appointments. One of the appointments is um, an individual by the name of Mike Waltz, um, sec- and I believe that he's being appointed to a National, National Security, Security Advisor. Advisor. Thank you. He's a former congressman, yeah. Former congressman. Um, I think Waltz is known for being both a China hawk and also he's been known for being very, very critical, especially of Trudeau, and he's also been very critical of NATO allies who do not pull their weight. Also interesting note, and I'm taking this from CBC, Mike Waltz's wife is apparently a, uh, I believe, vice president. I'll just double check this right now. She's a Trans Canada, I think. Yeah, she, sorry. She's a vice president for TC Energy Corp, so Trans Canada. Okay, so regardless of how you happen to feel about pipelines or Trans Canada, it's really, really good that someone in the immediate orbit of Trump's of the Trump administration is going to have that kind of Canadian connection and particularly a high level Canadian connection to any kind of Canadian extreme Canadian trade. That is good good news. Thank God for Wayne Gretzky, right? Right, exactly. Like any, any time that we can see somebody uh, in Trump's orbit or space have a strong Canadian connection, that is going to be good for us. And we should lean into that very strongly. What's also very interesting to me is that Waltz is um, been, sorry, on, on his social media, he's been just, openly critical of Trudeau on a couple of issues that bluntly are entirely deserved. Um, so he's been critical of Trudeau for his, you know, putting Canada Canada in the progressive messes that it's in. That's a direct quote. He's called Trudeau shameful for abstaining from a vote on Chinese gen- on the Chinese genocide of Muslim Uyghurs. Again, I'm quoting from uh, CBC here. This is a massive Get scandal. Off. He said one word. Again, correct. He's correct on that point. Waltz is 1,000% correct. Um, he lamented Trudeau's a government allowing the sale of a lithium mine to Chinese state-owned entity. Again, that's completely legitimate. Uh, he also complained about Chinese donors pledging a million dollars to Pierre Elliott Trudeau's foundation um, and, reportedly wa- and reportedly wanting to erect a statue of the first Chinese communist leader outside of Montreal University. Again, that is insane. <laughs> That's insane. We talked about the fa- the um, Trudeau Foundation donations previously and in the past, so I don't necessarily want to rehash that. But Waltz's criticisms there are legitimate. Uh, these are criticisms that could be made by any Canadian. Uh, so he's clearly informed about you know the state of our politics. He's got a view about the state of our politics. This is good. This is good for Canada. And also, if he's calling Canada out for its delinquent commitments to NATO, we deserve that. That's legitimate. So I, I don't know. I, I think that that... That is that is a, a sign and indication of where the the Trump administration's mindset is on Canada and its role in the world, and I think that also the connections that he has to Canada or and the knowledge that he has about Canada, you know, we want someone like that in the Trump administration. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, you've actually set me up beautifully for my there tangent you here. Um, you and I touched on this last week, uh, both in the podcast and in the written dispatch, but one of the themes that really ran through both was that the party's over, that it, we're going to be forced to deal with reality as it is now. And a few minutes ago, you were talking about uh, kind of the flood the zone with bullshit strategy and how the chaos is the point. It's a feature, not a bug. 
And one of the things I find really interesting about that is not what Trump is doing. It's that how people struggle to adapt to it. And there are people who probably on an intellectual level understand that Trump is a shrewd enough negotiator to deliberately push your buttons to get you to emote, mm -hmm. yet who cannot stop themselves from emoting. That's right. And we're going to be in an era where we're going to have to be really good. We're going to have to be nimble. We're going to have to be on our feet. And I don't know if we are. And I also think on top of that, there are the people, to your point, who will never understand that the feature isn't a bug. They will just not be able to get their heads wrapped around it. They will look at what Trump is doing and they will be just, what's that term you used two years ago that I keep referring to? Stun fucked. They will never be able to adapt to this. And I am really worried that that is basically going to describe the majority of the Canadian federal cabinet. There was a really interesting development this week. And so Jen, last week you and I were playing a bit coy because we had heard some interesting things and I think we can reveal one of those things now because it now has bubbled out into, into the open. One of the things we were hearing last week is that Canada was prepared to throw Mexico under the bus in order to preserve our market access to the United States and that we were going to strike first, that we were going to be relentless ruthless. Personally, I think there's two strategic problems with this. First of all, I think Canada's version of, of relentless and ruthless maybe is like a four out of 10 on the Donald Trump scale. So I don't, I, I, I still think we might've brought a knife to a gunfight on that one. The other problem is simply that Mexico will have a plan too, and we have vulnerabilities they can exploit. God though, it's an interesting comment on the overall state of things that like he's not even sworn in yet and allies are already turning on each other. So that's interesting and entirely to the Americans interest. This well, is also, great for that. I think the other, the other potential problem with that particular strategy, and as I said, I'm not necessarily opposed to Canada getting ruthless, whether it be under the aegis of a liberal government or a conservative one, we're going to have to be ruthless. It's just what it is. Um, but how much leverage do we have in the ruthlessness fight? Because America's Strong trade with Mexico now is larger than America's trade with, with Canada. We have certain cultural advantages, I, yeah, I think. That's exactly it. We have cultural advantages. Um, those cultural advantages have been eroded pretty significantly under Trudeau, bluntly. And in terms of sheer dollars, yeah, it I makes know. more sense for America to side with Mexico than it does with us, which is kind of what happened under Imska. So, or UMSCA, whatever, however you want to call it. New um, NAFTA. New NAFTA. So, yeah, okay, great. Happy to hear that we're getting our head in the game, but now we have to ratchet that up 20, 30 points. Doug um, Ford other was the one who took the shot. Premier Doug Ford unprompted this week at a press conference through Mexico under the bus. I don't know if that was coordinated with Christopher Freeland. I honestly don't. I doubt Christopher Freeland minded. Doug Ford can be the bull in that China shop, right? He can go out there and be like, hey, it's time for us to, uh, to get real about trade. And to your point, I think you've, you've phrased it really elegantly. We have ideological and political synergies with the Americans that the Mexicans don't. That's our advantage. Mexico's advantage, sheer cash. They're worth more. So, I mean, there's a reason why American presidents, and not just Donald Trump, stopped coming to Canada first after they were inaugurated. That happened. I need to go double check exactly what was. I think it was W. Uh, was W or Obama? I think it might have been Obama. Well, I don't, I don't anyway, know. I'll, I'll check that. But it, it it was news, and it was a long time ago because we're old now, and you can tell because our brains are starting to rot. But you know, it was. I remember it being significant news when it with the first president who did not come to Canada first after they were inaugurated. Traditionally, the the relationship between America and Canada was so strong that the first foreign visit that, a, that an American president would make after they had been inaugurated was to Canada. That stopped. Well, if Canada and the U.S. are so tightly inter interwoven, we're like not exactly foreign. We're not exactly domestic, but we're not exactly foreign, or at least it used to be that way. Well, the, the, it's going to be an interesting decision about whether or not we take the hide under the table and hope they don't notice a strategy or that no, 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 we're your friends, we're your friends strategy. Like, I think there's going to have to be a coordinated decision about whether or not we're going to try and avoid America's notice or not and what's in our strategic best interests. I mean, the, the risk of the hide, hide and hope they don't, hope they forget about a strategy is that they may implement 
rules or tariffs that hurt us accidentally, yep. right? Like, for example, there have been some interesting discussions and, and proposals, for example, to, to ban or to put significant um, tariffs on the import of foreign oil designed to target oil from Venezuela or Saudi, for example. We're also foreign oil. You know, and also all of our foreign oil is essentially processed in Texas. I mean, like, you know, if this, shh, do we get an exemption for that? Can we quietly negotiate an exemption for that? What would it take to get us an exemption for that? I think these are interesting questions that I suspect that Canada needs to start considering. The, um, the big picture tangent I want to go on here is related to this, right? Because throwing Mexico under the bus uh, to save our NAFTA access or Kuzmar, I don't know. We used to be better at acronyms. New acronyms suck. Umska NAFTA was terrible. way better. Yes. Um, Umska sounds like, like a porn video. It does. <clears throat> yes. Pro um, probably yes, is. it does. It sounds like some kind of terrible, like, uh, refuse from a, from a, ter from a, a degenerate sex act. I don't know what to tell Jen woke up in a different mood than I did today, but that's okay. I'm here for it. Um, there was a really, so the, the idea of getting ruthless and relentless, um, which I hope you are also not linking to, to porn in your mind <laughs> is interesting, right? Cause I don't think we're, we're not, I don't think we're naturally very good at that. I have said in the past that I think Krista Freeland gets it. I've written in my columns that I think her worldview as she expresses it aligns pretty closely with mine. And I think she and I have a similar understanding of what's happening, but also I look at her government and I'm like, well, where's the beef? Like, come on, like show me the signs of this. And then I said to you a minute ago, cause we're talking about the, uh, the feature versus bug people, how some people are never, ever going to be able to get it. And I worry that it might be the rest of the cabinet, but I want to put a pin on that just a second. I am going to come back to it, but I want, I want to invite the, the listeners and the viewers to go on a little bit of a journey with me. I read this week, uh, it's an American columnist, uh, a left-leaning economist named Noah Smith, a uh, mm -hmm. really good writer. I, I really like his work. He has his own Substack now, so a fellow Substacker, thumbs up. He had been writing a really interesting thing. You and I have spoken about this already. Democrats badly underperformed in the cities. They still won the highly densely populated urban counties, but on significantly reduced vote margins, which means by the time the Democrats tried to execute their suburban strategy, they were already hundreds of thousands of votes behind in some of these states because the cities moved to the right big time. One of the things Smith said was, I thought it was really, you articulated it really well in a column we published on a Substack this week, which was, well, of course, people in the cities moved to the right. The lefties have fucked the cities. And like, if you look around and obviously there's always exceptions to this, some cities are particularly well run because of local factors, but overall in the United States, and I think in Canada as well, our cities have visibly decayed in recent years. They're less safe. They're less clean. They're dirtier. They're overcrowded. The transit systems don't work and voters are smart enough to know who's running the shop there. And they drew conclusions. And the reason I, I said this might be just a little bit of a journey, I think I can, like, we could let Smith's point stand. And I think the, the, the viewers and the listeners would be well served for having heard of it, but it actually tickled a little bit of a brain thing for me. You know, all those brain thermobobs when like an idea forms. And I began thinking a little bit because RFK Jr., a uh, colorful, colorful rascal that he is. Wait has been nominated by Trump to be the health and uh, human services secretary in the United States. Perfect. Okay. It's going to be great. Get your vaccines now mm -hmm. and probably start boiling your own milk. We're all going to need a home pasteurization system. I would also um, suggest that uh, now would be the time to stock up on food coloring if you expect to have color on your cakes going forward. But that's yeah. another. Well, and you, and you do bake wonderful cakes. Mm -hmm. um, it's very pretty. One of the things I was thinking about, because I'm looking at reaction from Canadian progressives in particular in shock and horror at RFK's announcement. And honestly, I get it. I don't want brain worn guy running the largest federal health bureaucracy in the world either. Didn't he's also the guy what, who ran over a bear and like left it in central park. Well, who wouldn't, I mean, nobody, but why, what else would one do in that situation? Um, it occurred to me that our liberals, including our prime minister, have done a great job 
talking about things. There's different phrases they use, but norms, guardrails, rules-based international order, democratic institutions, things like that. And I agree with their saying all the right things on this one, but it occurred to me, and this is going to be my way of putting it, and it might be a future column or a dispatch item. The problem, we talked about Mike Waltz being a particular critic of Trudeau. The problem Trudeau has is he only defends our institutions on a theoretical level. He says the right things. He admires the institutions on a theoretical level. He admires the norms on a theoretical level, but he's not been prepared to make the investments and do the hard work, including being relentless and ruthless at times to preserve those institutions. And there's just a couple of really interesting stories this week that came out. So give, give me just a minute. I'm going to stitch a bunch of different things together. Sure. There was a story this week about a, a, like an audit of student visas coming into Canada revealed like 10,000 of them were essentially fraudulent. They were just gateways to get people into the country. Justin Trudeau, Mark Miller, Sean Fraser before him would have spent the last nine years defending Canada's immigration system in theory, but they weren't watching the pot on the stove in practice. Toronto, last couple of nights, uh, over, the, well, over the last week or so, there have been two insane shootings where like gangs have gotten into out and out gun, gun battles in public with dozens or hundreds of rounds flying around. It is astonishing no one has been killed. Justin Trudeau in the handgun freeze made a guy like made, made it impossible for a guy like me to buy a pistol, even though I've been licensed for 20 years and I have a safe in my house. There are so many examples of when our government in this country did the thing that was good in theory or sounded good on a, on a speaking circuit or a tweet or an Instagram reel, but they were only observing the rules-based international order in theory because we weren't contributing to it because our military rusted out. We were, we were adhering to the to global liberal free trade in theory because I can't buy good French cheese. We, we, we were talking about our, our, our hard-headed, pragmatic immigration system. In theory, while there were like diploma mills in the greater Toronto area and Vancouver churning out student visas and causing a housing crisis, or at least contributing to a housing crisis. And I don't think Canada now, and I'm kind of looping this back to, to, to Noah Smith's idea, people who have overseen these failures either need to start admitting that some failures have occurred and taking accountability for them, or they're going to get steamrolled by history. Because Trudeau, again, for nine years at office, has gotten, in general, I say this as a, as a compliment. This is not a criticism. Justin Trudeau, in general, in his public conduct, has brought esteem to the office. He's had some stupid moments. He elbowed that lady in the boob. and like There have been stupid moments, but in general... The prime minister has understood the, the symbolic duties of being a prime minister. He shows up at the right events. He puts out the right statements. He has the right tone at international summits. He's observed the theoretical niceties of the active and engaged good global citizen that a G7 country should be engaged in, but he hasn't done it in practice. Well, and this is why nobody takes him seriously. Takes him seriously. And I think in like what, what Smith was saying, like all these city councils in America, I'm sure all the city councils have passed their nuclear ban, like nu nuclear weapon free zone resolutions. The, they've flown the trans uh, pride flag. They passed um, resolutions condemning Israeli bombing campaigns in, in Gaza and, yeah. and Lebanon. Yeah. But then people are getting like knifed on the subway. Didn't, didn't, show, didn't show up for the menorah lighting ceremony. But there's encampments under every overpass. Yeah. And I think what we've probably be under reach, and this is, well, Jen, I confess, this is not a completely novel insight. It's not even mostly a novel insight. It's not even the first time you and I have talked about this. Like Trudeau be over-invested in the symbolic gesture and not the meaningful follow-through mm -hmm. is probably the through line that most observers and commentators have written about him throughout his, his prime ministership. Yeah. But I think now... It takes on a much bigger picture because a guy like Mike Waltz, a guy like um, 
Secretary of State designate uh, Marco Rubio, guys like whoever is likely to end up the new ch Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon, they're not interested in what we can do for them in theory. The th theoretical they're, they're, era of Canadian governments is over. Well, enough. So nobody cares what we say. Nobody cares what we say. You want to get Melanie Jolie or Christy Freeland up on a thing or send them to Davos or send them to, you know, give a speech at the UN. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares what we say. Not only has you not I, only has our hard power eroded, but our soft power has also collapsed in turn. So nobody gives a shit what Canadian has to say, Canadians have to say anymore. They just don't. It's about what we can do. And I think we can do better than we are. I mean, I think fundamentally what you're saying comes down to the idea if you're really, really pissed off at Donald Trump, and if you're really, really pissed off that Pierre Polyev is about to win a thumping majority, have you considered governing good? Maybe if you tried governing good, these people would not be viable, not only viable, but overwhelmingly more popular than you. I don't know. Just, just a radical thought. There will always be someone out there with a chart showing nominal GDP per capita. Oh, and nominal GDP. This is a, this is a, look at our dollars. And yes, everything's great. Look, look at this. Look at this uh, survey of 10,000 people from around the country or around the globe. You know, a ranked survey of reputation ranked, very highly. Very highly. We did a survey of of, of two hundred thousand uh, high school students from across Southeast Asia, and Canada is the place to be because they saw mountains on a poster sometime. I mean, they are beautiful. They're, I mean, they're more your thing than mine because the geography, but the mountains are beautiful. Full full hat tip to that. Well, they're not no, burning. Look, they're great. I think the era of Canada functioning on a theoretical level is over. We're going to have to start functioning on an actual, practical, substantive level now. And I'm not doom and gloom on this. I think we can. I think, I, I think we can. But we're going to have to actually do it. Like, the, we, we're not going to be able to turn deliverology into a punchline again. We're actually going to need to start deliverologizing some stuff and governmenting good. Can I share? Can I just share a funny little meme that came on my feed on Facebook today? And that is, it's sure. a picture. It's a picture of the beautiful Eglinton Crosstown um, LRT, like just the, the 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 artist's rendering of the Eglinton LRT. And it a couple says, hundred feet from my house. Yeah, it says, and and the phrase is, "Treat yourself like the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, and never stop working on yourself, no matter how inconvenient it is for everybody else." And under this little feet was a note that this LRT has been off and on construction for like what thirteen years. Um, I mean, de depending on how you wanted to define that, it could you could say it goes right back to the eighties with the Eglinton and West Subway. Oh, the worse. important thing okay. is that it's five years overdue. Like it right. was supposed to open in twenty in two thousand twenty. Or you look and at the Green Line LRT here in Calgary that it was now 13 years into the making and $1.3 billion spent and pretty much all that's been done is some land's been appropriated and some like pylons dug up. I mean, yeah. They I, were I, building I, transit in theory. Here's, yeah, building transit in theory is what we've been doing. Clearing out encampments and providing homeless services in theory. In theory. Providing mental health supports to a vulnerable population in theory. Operating an effective criminal justice system in theory. Having an armed forces in theory. Having access to health care in theory. We're, 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 we're all good on the theory. We're all in agreement about the theory of these things, of being good things that we should be doing. I mean, what I would like to actually do, and I'm going to put the call out here for anybody, any, any aspiring writers... I would like to write, uh, do a series or a couple of columns of some kind explaining why Canada can't build shit, why we no build good, why Canada no build good, why we can't build things. We should well, get a graphic done why, for that. We can run it across. Why Canada no build good? Why Canada no build good? Read the line. Um, a new how, series, why Canada no build good. Why does it now take us so long to build basic infrastructure? Why is the infrastructure always overpriced? Why is it when it comes in, it's half of what was promised? Why is it when it's coming in, we see, you know, immediate maintenance failures and breakdowns? Ottawa come, LRT. Ottawa LRT, it's it's yeah. pipelines, it's 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 basic infrastructure, it's major Calgary's road infrastructure, it's Calgary's water system, it's um, you know, it's it's housing. Why can't we? Why can't why can't we build a million houses in Ontario? Why why can Canada no build good? And to be honest with you, I think that there's it's not one. I don't think it's one thing. It's because we think, only do stuff in theory. Like there's no actual doers. It's theoretical talkers and signalers. 
It's, it's we will we will commission a, a report to look into the housing crisis that will give us a clear eyed pr perspective on what needs to be done on the housing crisis. Inputs it's, and outputs. It's, it's, it's all the inputs are process. It's it's there were signs that there were major issues with the immigration system, particularly as they pertain to international students. What two three years ago, and it took us how many years to get to the point where it was no longer racist to acknowledge that those problems existed and to actually sure. move on them in any meaningful way. I'm not convinced we're all the way there yet. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, the second we announce that there's going to be a, a collapse in in student in sorry, uh, international students, what do we see in the news this week? Fourteen thousand asylum seekers, which with processed how with whom? Um, by the way, I don't know if you actually all saw this as well, but a little note went around from Carleton to all of its resident, all of its students, basically saying as a result, uh, sort of as a direct result of the collapse in international students, their their economics have fallen apart. So they're going to have to undergo a massive review in terms of how they're spending. And my position on this is good. All of the internet, all of the secondary edu educational institutions need to start thinking about what their major priorities are and what their major priorities are not and whether or not they are overextended on non-major priorities. I think every aspect of Canadian society needs to do this now, right we now. We can't be a country in theory anymore. Why we no build things? Why, Why can we, we no build, build good things good? One more point on this, and it's is just this, a little bit. Is this bit... a country for ants? It's a Zoolander reference. I, I do get the reference. All right, there you go. Um, I prefer Star Trek references, but I did hmm. I did get that one. Got it. Um, You're here. Then. You're with me. Um, Stephen Gibo, environment minister. Yep, tell me. Talk. Don't honestly have a lot to say. He's off um, out cop or whatever. Um, forgot which one this is. And talking about like an emissions cap in Canada, and I've seen some. I've just seen like on on my social media, some of which I use for work purposes, some of which I don't. I'm just seeing ads about Canada's climate targets and plans, and it's getting talked about before. Right? It's mountains, it's rivers, it's streams, it's trees, and I'm going to piss people off when I say this because they're going to yell at me and go, "No, it didn't." I think climate change died two weeks ago. And I'm not saying the climate's going to stop changing. Like, I get it. We're going to have a lot of problems on that. But I think talking about the difference between in theory versus in practice, I think Stephen Gibault is going to show up at his next conference and be like, we have, a, we have an emissions cap on our, on our petroleum sector and our energy-starved allies at the far end of vulnerable transoceanic supply lines in a world where we're not convinced the U.S. fleet will patrol those sea lanes anymore. They're going to look at us and they're going to go, you did fucking what? Or, and it, like, and look again, Jen, I'm not a climate change denier. I accept that man-made carbon emissions are altering the earth's climate in ways not to our fortune. I get it. I, I am looking forward to, and I think the, I think the cost points in this are going to make it possible. I expect to one day have an EV that is charged entirely off the solar panels on my roof. The price points in these things are moving in good directions. I think economics are going to win on this, but they aren't there yet. But we acted like they were in theory. Do you remember like right uh, after no, no, Trudeau was no, elected in 15, hold Canada up. sent like the entire federal government to Paris? Yeah. Like we had by far the largest national delegation there? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so two, two, two points. One, I really do wonder if in the future... We're going to ask ourselves whether it made more sense to spend $13 billion of taxpayer subsidies ex creating an EV plant in, you know, the Rust Belt of Southern Ontario as opposed to spending $13 billion, say, radically expanding out our capacity to ship liquid natural Bellinger. gas around the world. Yeah, we'll buy a fleet of submarines. I, I, I do really wonder if we're going to look back and ask ourselves if if the the, the, mil, the billions of dollars we spent on that particular priority represented a significant opportunity cost on the geopolitical stage. Um, I do wonder that. The other one I would wonder about is uh, one of the little bits of news that I thought was very hilarious. And I'm not going to I'm going to screw up the details of this, so I apologize to our podcast listeners. I, I will clarify in our written dispatch, but. There was a little scandal at COP in Azerbaijan about uh, I think it was some of the the leaders or the hosts of of the of the conference being caught during the conference wheeling and dealing and trying to get like oil and gas investment into the country, 
And what I thought was so funny about that is like anybody who's been following or paying attention to these environmental and COP conferences for the last couple of years knows that that's basically what happens there. Everybody goes there about we're going to green the world and then they all get into back rooms and they're wheeling and dealing like it's it's a business conference now. That's why the oil and gas companies are all there. Sponsor it. Yeah. That's why they all sponsor it. So I, and, and I say that even as the oil, I acknowledge that the oil and gas companies are rebranding themselves as energy companies and they're diversifying into different kinds of energy streams because that's where the economics are going. It just makes sense to do that. It's what it is. But, you know, don't, don't be naive about these conferences, right? I mean, this is. Well, what, what are they for in theory? Versus what are, they, what are they for in practice? What are they for in practice? What, wh why is it that you can successfully get major state leaders and major state actors spending significant amounts of money to go give presentations about their their countries in front of delegates that include major investors in oil and gas? It's just, I don't know, just, I don't know, just going to do it. Maybe do the math on that one. I don't know. Um We've, we've already seen the federal government, and you and I talk about this on podcast. I actually made a prediction about this, that the liberals would throw their immigration plans and even their stated ideals in immigration. Those were going to go under the bus. Those were not going to survive first contact with reality. Mm -hmm. I'm honestly wondering how, we talked about this last week, talked about the G-forces of Canadian politics and what would actually just tear this government apart. How hard on energy and environmental policy can a Justin Trudeau-led liberal government in 2024-25 actually pivot? How hard can this government pivot into a dramatically and rapidly expanded Canadian armed forces? How hard on trade issues are we prepared? I, well, I'll rephrase that. How much hardball are we willing to play to protect some Quebec dairy farms. I don't know. And I think pragmatism is going to win sometimes. I'm not saying it's all going to be bad. There will be hard-headed pragmatic decisions that get made in the national interest. Like I said to you last week, can you imagine being Christopher Freeland having to explain the new world order to Melanie Jolie? Can you imagine Stephen Guibault getting back from COP and Jeff Prime Minister's like, well, ha! So a funny thing happened. I don't know. Let's, let's keep repeating the mantra to ourselves. America has a right to decide its own destiny. And on that note, we have more to talk about. We have the anti-Semitic roundup doo -doo -doo, coming up. And we're going to talk about Remembrance Day right after this break. Like and subscribe. In theory www. and in practice. In theory and in practice. Uh, www.readtheline.ca. This episode of The Line Podcast has been brought to you by Unsmoke Canada, which is dedicated to helping Canadians who are looking to quit smoking understand the full range of options available. Despite decades of government programs and regulations, today nearly 5 million Canadian adults smoke cigarettes. Adult smokers who choose to continue to smoke should be aware that other options exist. Right now, accessing information about these options is heavily restricted in Canada. While not risk-free, alternatives such as heated tobacco and vaping products provide a potentially less harmful choice than cigarettes. Cigarettes burn tobacco, resulting in smoke that contains 6,000 harmful chemicals that are associated with smoking-related disease and death. Heated tobacco and vaping products have the potential to significantly reduce this risk. Health agencies around the world are now considering these alternatives to help end smoking. Updated laws can help adult smokers better understand the full range of options available, including the relative risks of these products. Millions of Canadians smoke cigarettes. Technology exists that can help change that, but policymakers need to take actions. Learn more about how a smoke-free future can be achieved at unsmoke.ca. Well, I, I regret um, I must provide updates from the center of the universe uh, and adjacent to that are not great. Do you want to talk about the one that is publicly known or the one that's not publicly known? Oh, let's start with the one that is publicly known. Coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, at least it's been proposed in Mississauga, which is one of Toronto's suburbs, just to the west of the city. It's where the airport is. Um, there's going to be a rally, a vigil held on city-owned property. It's coming up in about 10 days. 
uh, to uh, memorialize Yaya Sinwar, the recently killed military commander of Hamas. Okay. Um, Couple couple points. One, um, I think you and I are both strongly in favor of basic liberal freedoms, including the absolutely. right to gather, the right yeah. to protest, the right to speak your mind. Absolutely. I would be very surprised if everyone who showed up at that vigil did not find themselves on some kind of also equally liberal and equally legal watch list. Yeah, the libertarian watch list for freedom and civil rights. Uh -huh. Couple other things. One, again, you want to hold a vigil to whomever you want. You can hold a vigil to Osama bin Laden. We are a free society. However, I have the right to observe that you are holding a vigil to Osama bin Laden in a free society. Draw a conclusion or two. And draw a conclusion or two. Mm -hmm. So everybody is exercising their rights here. If you're in the midst of talking about or responding to this vigil, the mayor of Mississauga is Carolyn Parrish. Carolyn Parrish had the following thing to say, and I quote, I just want to point out, and I'm not being a fish facetious. I'm sorry. Fitch. I'm going to try that again. I just want to point out, and I'm not being facetious, Nelson Mandela was declared a terrorist by the United States of America until the year 2008. Your terrorist and somebody else's terrorist may be two different things, the mayor said. And I Nelson said, Mandela Sinwar. I'm, I miss the part where Nelson Mandela orchestrated from prison the killings of fellow black South Americans who are collaborating with the South American apartheid regime. I miss that part. I miss the part where Nelson Mandela orchestrated a pogrom. Miss that. Um, miss the part where Nelson Mandela was overseeing a paramilitary organization that was torturing in dungeons other blacks, South yep. Africans. Missed the part where Nelson Mandela had, political power. Had, had, had orchestrated a military action in which he was willing to sacrifice his own people for the pursuit of freedom. Missed um, the part where Nelson Mandela triggered a war with a much more powerful neighbor while first having built a massive survival tunnel network for the preservation of his paramilitary forces, but had built precisely zero shelters for the civilian population. Missed that? That was the UN's problem. Miss that. But you know what? Uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. You know, my grandmother so, used to joke that it's a good thing to have an open mind, but not so open your brains fall out. And a lot of people, their brains have fallen out. And you wrote your two columns. We published them this week um, from Israel. And one of the things you said, and you're absolutely right, is that North Americans insist on projecting our own domestic pathologies onto the Middle East. <clears throat> and in fact, we seem to be incapable of separating our own <laughs> ideological and pathological frameworks from the conflict in the Middle East. Utterly incapable. There is... Um, Believe me, there was more that got into the draft on that point. Some good ink that happened. Yeah, it's, it's some good material that left on the cutting room floor. You know, one of the things I find interesting is that you'll find North Americans who are intellectually curious and open-minded value nuance and perspective, but the, what their failure of understanding is, maybe it's a failure of imagination, is that they have never lived in a part of the world that is riven by religious and sectarian divides, heavily garrisoned with ground forces and the odd thermonuclear ICBM. And they bring their Canadian perspective of, I grew up with lots of immigrants who were all the educated elite of those countries that got, at the time, difficult Canadian immigration papers, moved over to this country and sacrificed tremendously so that their kids could date me in high school or become like hockey hose heads. That's their framework of trying to understand the Middle East. And I don't know how to explain things to these people. Like until it is swamping her shores, which I don't know, it might not be that long, but like 
until and unless that happens. I mean, look, Carolyn Parrish is going to Carolyn Parrish. All right. So our younger, like you and I are of an age. We were, we know Carolyn Parrish. Some of our younger viewers and listeners may not. Google and Wikipedia are going to be your friend on that one. She's you the can, dumbest bent breathing in Canadian politics. I, I like the way I said it better, but there there was verve to how you said it, and I, I like verve. Um, I was talking uh, this week with Michael Levitt, a uh, former uh, liberal MP from, from York Center, and now he's at uh, the CEO and president of Friends of Simon uh, Wiedenthal Center. He was being incredibly polite in how he was saying, he's like, I found the mayor's comment shocking. I said, Mike, I found them appalling. I couldn't quite work up any shock. And I'd also like to point out, this would be very different, a very different conversation if we were talking about the people of Mississauga holding a vigil for the lost lives of the children in Gaza. Different conversation. Different conversation. You wouldn't have to mention it if that's what it was. We wouldn't mention it, of course. There's a very different conversation, even even going so far as to say independent Palestinian state or holding a vigil to support an independent. Okay, sure. Okay. Dress warm. Dress warm. You know, I mean, but a vigil for Sinwa, that's that's a support for Hamas. The Nelson Mandela of Palestine, Jen. Bra- Mind so open. That's a choice. Brains just. That's a, that's a choice. That's a choice right there. You lost me. You lost me there. The only redeeming feature of any of this is that it is Carolyn Parrish. So that. <laughs> You know, like the the old joke about the self licking ice cream cone. Like Carolyn Parrish political flop is sort of a self answering scandal. It's like, well, how did this? Oh, well, um, okay. Like it's okay. like the flow chart on a Carolyn Parrish political face plant is basically just a really con- like tight circle. It's just zip, it's Carolyn Parrish. So I'm not gonna um, like Mississauga guys. God, you're letting down the GTA on this one. And <laughs> um Okay. Yeah, like okay. You know what, what is it you've been saying? Mississaugans have the right to choose their own destiny. Mississaugans have the right to choose their own destiny. And they chose and, Carolyn Parrish. And and the rest of us have a right to observe and take their positions on these matters at face value. The other thing kind of hard to form the next sentence because I, my soul is somewhere off in the void. Um, <laughs> All right. You want to talk about the thing that isn't publicly known? Well, it's a little bit public now. And actually, it's a little bit more serious than what we've just been talking about now. So we're going to have to kind of like etch a sketch our brains, get Carolyn Parrish out of them and actually like really hunger down. Um, I heard this week from a friend, someone I know personally. That there had been a security incident outside the daycare, uh, an, an identifiably Jewish daycare where his kids go to, uh, are, are in daycare. And it hadn't uh, made public news yet. So, and it's not that I don't trust my friend, but you know, you and I are in the same business, like trust but verify, right? So I don't believe any version of something until I see an independent account of it. So I told him, keep me posted and send me whatever information you can find. And he did uh, indeed send me the info that the daycare had circulated to families reporting the incident. Uh, and now the Toronto police have come out with a statement, including surveillance photo of the suspect, uh, where they're looking for a man who, again, allegedly important, free society, innocent, proven guilty. But what apparently allegedly happened was that a mom was at uh, daycare, again, a Jewish daycare at a Jewish community center to pick up her kids when she was uh, suddenly attacked by a man. She was not seriously hurt, thank God. She was roughed up, bruised, but no serious injuries and no children were harmed. Uh, But you can imagine, given the state of things, the shockwaves that sent through uh, the Jewish community in Tra. And a couple of points I want to make, but one of them... Well, first, I, did, I, I do think we should add a caveat to this. We, we, we specifically said earlier on in this podcast that the state of Canadian cities and American cities is rapidly deteriorating. It's and very keep, possible this guy's a nutter. Yeah. 
yeah. had nothing to do with the nothing to do with her. Very possible. Very, it is very possible. It's inconvenient if that's the case because it's bad timing. But yeah, it's possible. Sure. What also just jumped out at me. I'm very forgiving. I'm very moderate, and maybe even you could say progressive on understanding and forgiving uh, crimes committed by the mentally ill. That's not their fault. That's our fault. But we, if, if people are out there on the streets, particularly those who have repeated incidences of this, like a, a cycle of it, mm-hmm. if we're leaving people out there in the, in the just full hun psychosis because we're squeamish about how to handle that, which is probably going to mean commitment, involuntary commitment and forced treatment. Let's be blunt about that. Let's, let's just say the things. If we're squeamish about that and we let these people out in public and they commit horrible acts because they are not in possession of, of their faculties, it's not their fault. That's our fault. That's on us. And I, and I, I mean that very strongly, but, and again, you're 100% right. That could be the case, but I wanted to speak just from my heart here, uh, for a second, as awkward as that'll be for all of us here. I found myself thinking about this crime with particular revulsion. Maybe it's just the dad in me, dad genetics coming through. But I hold any crime that targets young mothers or children in a, in a kind of particular revulsion, like something in my genetic code, right back to the monkey caveman days, is that we're supposed to protect those people. And targeting them is not just a crime. It feels to me beyond asocial, it's antisocial. Like attacking a woman, picking up her young children at a daycare is not a crime against a person. And if this guy isn't a psycho, if this was anti-Semitic, it's not even a crime against a community. It's a crime against human nature. You've got to be a sick fucking puppy. Again, assuming you're not literally a sick fucking puppy. But like, if you're not actually in the grips of a full-on psychotic breakdown and you attack a mom outside of a daycare who's juggling like a, a diaper bag, a stroller, all that stuff. I would get us in trouble with our streaming platforms if I finished the next sentence that just bubbled up to my lips. Okay, so here, here's, here's where you and I differ. I have a very different picture of human nature. I think a lot of the norms and expectations of behavior are, are socially induced by institutional expectation and culture and society, I think our nature is bad. I think our nature is, I think our nature is extremely bad. New I podcast think, tagline. Yeah, like, and actually, Dangerous, by the way. I think our nature is bad. I'm not, like, I'm not long on human nature, okay? I'm, I'm short on human nature. I, I, I think that we managed to drag ourselves out from some very depraved bullshit through many, many hundreds of years of establishing norms of human behavior that are very unnatural. I think there's nothing more natural in the world than attacking a defenseless woman and her child if you hate them. I think it's a very human thing to do. It's not an, it's not an acceptable thing to do, and it's not a legitimate thing to do. And like, just for a moment, let's take aside the, the possibility that this is just some psychologically unwell individual who randomly attacked a woman and, and a child. Let's take that possibility, accept that as a possibility, and put that aside here. Let's take the other possibility. The other possibility is that this is some absolutely deranged individual who is targeting this woman because she's Jewish and because he saw that as a legitimate act against the Jewish people in retaliation for what's happening in the Middle East. That's fucking insane. That is not legitimate. I refuse to accept that as legitimate. I refuse to accept that as a social norm in my society. I'm about done with that argument. And I think a lot of Canadians are about the fuck done with that argument. These are not legitimate acts of freedom fighters. These are not legitimate acts of protests. That is completely and utterly unacceptable. And we should come down on people like that with the hand of fucking God. I'm done. I, I'm Steve, done with that. People I, I, look at me weird when I suggest my plan to build really big trebuchets and just hurl these people into the ocean. Well, let's let's have after after after, okay, in the, 
after after a fair and and uh, straightforward before trial a jury and of your peers before and a jury an of automatic your peers review process an automatic review process yeah, judicial review and mandatory upon conviction of course. again these are these are norms that we've established for a reason as a bulwark against our terrible nature they and matter then we fire you out of a trebuchet then we'll fire you out of a trebuchet into the ocean deal that's my kind of party all right you know I was thinking a little more seriously here and it actually. Um, it might be a better tagline than we are bad. Um, our nature is bad, but I think it's it's a through line that runs through our both of our segments here. We're gonna make a we're gonna make kind of a hard tonal pivot in the third segment, but something that would flow through one and two is uh, something I might have mentioned in the podcast before. I, th I think you, at the very least, will have heard it. I don't know if I've said it on the record in the podcast, but I've just been thinking a lot these last few weeks, and I'll, even a little bit over the last year, especially since October seventh what David Trump wrote about the U.S. border. And I, I don't remember when he wrote it. It would have been around the time of Trump won, maybe when he was campaigning or maybe shortly after he'd taken office. I'll go, maybe I'll just email him and ask him. But what he wrote was that if liberals won't defend borders, fascists will. And I, I think that's kind of the through line through both of our talks here, which is you can't protect moms outside daycares in theory. Like, you actually need to have the state capacity to protect, if necessary, with hard kinetic force, vulnerable sites, to have a police force that can respond and make arrests, to have a court system that can then lead people through the process in a relatively and, expeditious... And on, and on to the trebuchet. Or, or well, well, I was going to say a correctional search system, but that might include trebuchets. I'm open to that. We don't really have any of those things. And one of the reasons I get worried about this stuff is because like there have been times in my life and, and, and in yours where you have a politician comes in or a, a, a blue ribbon task force or something and they go up, well, well, we found the problem, you know, this thing was broken or this official was corrupt or there was a design flaw in this bridge, which is why a bunch of school kids in a big yellow bus drowned. Like the problem we have now is that I think if we actually did like a top to bottom inventory of like our state apparatuses, I'm going to have to channel Apollo 13 here when he goes, what do we have on the spacecraft that's good? And the guys at mission control have nothing to tell him. So... If our nature is bad and the only thing that holds it in check are A, social norms, and B, effective state institutions, uh-oh. Well, it's, it's, it's really testing the human nature being good or bad dichotomy, isn't it? Um, the other thing I would just say is I think it's time for us as a society. We've been, we've been a very good high-trust society for a very long time, and that's a good thing. And I would like to keep that train going, but I do think that because we've been a very good, very high trust society for a very long time, we've lost a couple of survival instincts, beads of reality. Mm. One of which that we don't just punish crime in order to rehabilitate people; we punish crime in order as a deterrence mechanism. Or I don't really, know. I don't really give a shit what you believe. You can believe whatever you want. We're in a free society. I'm not going to control your thoughts. I'm not even going to control your speech. I don't really care. Say whatever you want. But when you shove the woman, but at I'm the day sure. Care, fuck going to give a shit about you engaging in acts of physical violence in reaction to what you believe. That's where we draw the line. And if we don't see strong response for that kind of act by police, by our state capacity, by our state institutions, by our courts, or if our state institutions have lost the capacity to act strongly and in a method to create a deterrence mechanism, that's not going to lead to good places for either, for people of any descent in any circumstance. You know, on my bookshelf, just right off to my right right now, I can't quite reach it, but if I leaned in this chair, I could grab it. I'm pretty sure I have a copy of a book I was given, or was at the National Post many, many moons ago. And what we used to have, and I'm sure it still happens, is that the publishers send you free copies of their books and they hope you review them. So part of what we would do kind of every month on the editorial boards, we'd have this gigantic box of books and we just divide them up and then everybody take home six of these, plow through them. And by Monday, tell me, is it good? Is it bad? Should we run excerpts? Should we review it? Like whatever. 
And I wrote this one and we were all giggling about it because it had a ridiculous title. It was called In Defense of Flogging. So we were all joking about how that kind of, well, it sounds pornographic to channel Jen from segment one. But what it actually was basically was an actual history of, of justice, of the, the correctional system in the West and how shame and physical corporal punishment was often the, the response to what were perceived by the standards of the time to be low level crimes. So you're a debtor. Well, we're going to put you in the stocks for a couple of days and everyone's going to know and that everyone in town is going to know that you fell behind on your, on your debts. Or you did a bad thing. We're going we're gonna to flog you. We're actually going to have like, uh, there's a guy in the village whose job it is, is to be like the flogger. Who we He was really into it, by the way. Pardon me? He was really into that, by the way. Well, the, the no shortage of volunteers. Um, the people we incarcerated were the people where it was not safe for them to be in public. Where it was like, this person must be either executed or literally put in a box with bars on it because it's not safe for them to be outside because they'll hurt people. And I'm not calling for flogging or the stocks or anything like that, but I am saying we need to start viewing our criminal justice system as a solution to a problem, not a platform for social signaling. And theme of the show, right? It has to work in practice, not in theory. And right now, I don't think it is. So, on that note, yay. like and subscribe to the line. And I think we're going to end off our podcast today by talking about Remembrance Day. We, so Matt, we are going to end this podcast by talking about an issue that I think actually sums up the earlier two segments quite well. And that is this week. It came uh, as a response to Remembrance Day, and of course. We on our on veterans. Monday. It was on Monday, and and I took my kids down to the field of crosses that we have here in in Calgary, and attempted to reiterate the the you know really quite horrific war, set of wars that put so many young men um, on those crosses to my children who were not terribly receptive to the message, but we'll work on that. But anyway, uh, then news came out that um, a principal by the name of Aaron Hobbs, who is the head of the Ottawa's Sir Borden, sorry, Sir Robert Borden High School, decided to change things up for Remembrance Day. He decided to, during the ceremony, uh, allowing allow an Arabic language Palestinian protest song to be played during the assembly three times, I believe. And when challenged on this point, his quote was. Uh, he characterized Remembrance Day as um, usually about being, quote, a white guy who has done something related to the military. So let's start. Let's start with the real basic, real basics on this one. The first thing is Remembrance Day is not about some white guy doing something related to the military. Remembrance Day is about commemorating how many dead Canadian what? How more than 100,000 now. More than 100,000 dead Canadian and the, and soldiers. Like the, whole, like the whole gamut of people who could be identified as having served with the Canadian forces in sure. any form is over 100,000 dead. Over 100,000 dead people. 100,000 dead people, including people just like Aaron Hobbs. And I'm willing to bet some of Aaron Hobbs' own family members and ancestors, judging by his, the looks of them, who were sent overseas and died in wars that they didn't choose that they did because they felt that this was a necessary act of duty in honor to the service of a country that they were attempting to build. And we honor the memories of those people who made that sacrifice, regardless of where our positions are on the war or the necessity of those wars. I mean, in our Canadian mythology and our, our, our storytelling and our ethos, these wars were foundational to the building of our national identity. In our mythos, you know, we, we sent young men to die in order to counter the the threats of particularly Nazism. Um, and in our mythos, we sent those men over to die in order to preserve certain institutional values and certain freedoms back home. Now, I mean, I'm sure that you guys can get into nuanced Twitter debates about the validity of that mythology. It's a mythology. It's not strictly history. Um, but I think it is whether or not you, you want to nitpick at, at it, it is a it is a unifying mythology that, for many many generations, ours included, has defined Canada as a nation. 
It's one of the few things left in our national mythology that define us as a nation, all right? And I don't care what color you are, white or otherwise. You know, when you come to Canada and you accept this, mytho this, this nation as your home, you are included in that mythology, regardless of whether or not the men died abroad were the same color and ethnicity as you, all right? I have family members who served in the war. I've got now extended family members who, who whose names were on the crosses of the field that we sent our kids to look at. I have other family members who weren't and who didn't serve in the war. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I'm still part of the Canadian family and I still can identify with the sacrifices of my ancestors. And my ancestors, not just my blood ancestors, by the way, my, my, my mythological ancestors of whom all of these men are. So I don't national care what color. Ancestors. They're nas national ancestors. I don't care if you're not white. I don't care what color you came from. I don't care what country you came from. When you come to Canada, this mythology is now yours and you become part of it. And the story becomes part of your story. And that's what a nation is. That's how we need to define our nations. So, Mr. Frickin' Aaron Hobbs, who's white as the day is goddamn long, your issues with your ethnicity or your issues with your ethnicity stop projecting that shit on everybody else. Not everybody accepts that framing of Remembrance Day, nor finds it appropriate or acceptable. Um, as for the choice of a pro-Palestinian protest song, one of, the big mytho one of the big things that I was always taught during mythologies, and the reason why Remembrance Day's ceremony were so sacred was because it was about not honoring the war dead as in yay war. It was about honoring the war dead as a lesson to future generations about the horrors of war. And don't do this again. Don't do this again was the message. Peace was supposed to be the lesson of Flanders Fields. Peace was the meaning. It was honoring the war dead, but also understanding the lessons and sacrifices of the war dead to encourage us to consider peace as being the future. We don't so, celebrate the days of our victories. We commemorate the days the guns fell silent. Correct. All right? So to try and sort of juxtapose that, with a pro-Palestinian protest song, not only is that inappropriate from a nation building and mythological point of view, it's also emotionally and tonally inappropriate. It's emotionally and tonally inappropriate. If you want to actually expand the meaning of Remembrance Day and sort of like say, say make a desire or a quest for peace in the Middle East, I think that would be an appropriate emotional tone to be carrying into it. Trying to like blend Remembrance Day with a pro-war protest song, Go Palestinian, is fucking idiotic. That's fucking insane, in addition to being inappropriate. Yeah. It's not an appropriate movement. Like As I said, I think I would have no problem, for example, with um, expanding Remembrance Day to honor people, the, the, the people who've died in war across the Middle East, including, for example, Syria or Sudan. These are ongoing conflicts. Or, or, and including people in like, let's let's have a moment of peace for the the, the kids of Gaza or, or the or the victims of October seventh, and let's 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 remember that war has a terrible price. In that kind of context, I think that would be appropriate for a Remembrance Day ceremony. But a full on protest song, you're now glorifying acts of violence, not glorifying acts of peace. In that context, and and to me, that is just so. First thing damaging to like the national understanding of this holiday but i think it's also just i don't understand how your ideology gets you to a place that's that stupid I, it's just it's not you're I've, I've looked at aaron hobbs's face i guarantee you he's about the same age as me i guarantee you he was raised in the same kinds of schools and i that i was i guarantee you that he understands what remembrance day means and you he understands what, and ought to understand that it doesn't mean this he spent too much time in schools. That's probably the answer. Like I'm married to a teacher. I love teachers. I, I love me some teachers. Um, they, uh, they operate in a very unusual human environment. And I say this again, with all respect to my wife, who is beautiful and whom I love and to any listeners and viewers out there who are teachers, I've had an interesting viewpoint being married to one of what it does to a normal adult human being to spend almost all their time surrounded by children. And my wife's a kindergarten teacher. So she spends all day with like five-year-olds. Like that, that's an interesting thing to do to someone. And I think in the same way that probably this Hobbs guy, who's yeah, as white as I am, 
Um, sometimes you spend so much time in an environment, you forget how artificial it is and hmm. you need to get out there. Like the idea that he would describe Remembrance Day as something where we commemorate white people who did something with the military is the sign of someone to be who not who is stupid, but who is just monumentally out of touch with the society around them. And the funny thing is, when you had told me that you wanted to do segment three on the Remembrance Day story, I went, cool. I thought you meant the Nova Scotia one. Oh, God. Did you hear the Nova Scotia one? No. What happened okay, in Nova it's Scotia? Not, okay, so Nova Scotia right now is having a provincial election. And this guy kind of got sucked up into the media machine of the Nova Scotia provincial election. But what happened was that like a principal at a school in Nova Scotia, uh, Nova Scotia, by the way, having a significant Canadian Armed Forces presence because Atlantic Fleet is based there, right? And there's there's other other Air Force and Army units that support the Atlantic Fleet. Uh, put out a memo like in the weekly school newsletter, encouraging every, all the parents to attend to um, to to attend the Remembrance, Remembrance Day ceremony, but asked uh, serving military personnel not to wear their uniforms because it could upset people. Yeah, that was and stupid. Then, and then it got observed because the like every like. The, the whole social media grist machine, the mill is running in, in Nova Scotia. So this guy like whipped right up to a national story very quickly. The school immediately backed down, apologized, said, yeah, that, that was an error on our part. But it's the kind of error that makes sense when you spend all your time dealing with kids and fellow publicly unionized <laughs> educators. It's not real life. It's not, but it can feel like it if you spend 40 or 50 hours a week in it. My, again, my wife's a teacher, kindergarten teacher. When I ask her occasionally, what are you doing for Remembrance Day? And she'll go like, well, you know, the kids are pretty little, so they'll be in assembly and they'll get like poppy stickers. And, and we say this is the day where we give thanks and remember people who have died so that Canada could be safe and protect us from, from bad things. And I think that's totally appropriate for what my wife yeah, sure. is doing. Absolutely. But the problem is you get, they get out to grade five or grade eight or grade 12, and it doesn't get much more sophisticated than that. Like, we might as well still be putting poppy stickers on them and saying, well, it's to make sure people are safe from the bad stuff. You know, I, and also, I do wonder if whether or not you can trace some of the rise in anti-Semitism that's currently proliferating and proliferating in our society to the fact that we have neutered our education on the Holocaust. We've neutered our education and and, and sort of emotionally yeah. emotionally toned down and even for when we were kids they've been, we've emotionally oh, toned yeah. down um remember say i mean i remember when in the upper grades in in it, when we learned about remembrance day and we learned about world war ii and world war one and, and all these things we had newsreels of i mean i remember my husband telling this he were, vividly remembers watching a 15 minute newsreel where there were bodies being thrown into open pits yes. with bulldozers like they we were shown that I mean, Schindler's List, we were shown that in class. We got a real hard emotional lesson. And as much as media can give us that emotional lesson about what happened there and why it was significant and why it was important. And I wonder that as we've moved, I mean, I don't want to go into the full, oh, they've become still fits. But as education has become less and less comfortable with hard emotions, if the education that is happening from for Remembrance Day and about those wars has become more emotionally neutral. And as a result of that, people don't have a, have, a, have less and less of an actual instinct, instinctual understanding of what they're engaging in when they throw firebombs at synagogues and what kind of echoes of history that brings up for a lot of people who have received that education. Um, the, other thing I just, I, the other thing I just want to point out as well is just like, there have been movements in recent years, for example, the white poppy movement. So instead of sure. instead of instead of the the we yellow pop or the red poppy, we're going to change the white poppy because yeah, we want pacifist we, white poppy. We want to we want to commemorate pacifism and peace. That's actually been very controversial in some quarters, particularly conservative quarters. I never found that controversial. Controversial. I had no problem with the white poppy movement. I have no problem with trying to repurpose aspects of Remembrance Day to be more peace focused or more pacifistic, if that is your value set. That's fine. You're not dishonoring anybody by doing that. Okay. I think you're dishonoring yourself, but you're not dishonoring well, anyone else. Fine. You want to be a pacifist. That's fine. I'm not a pacifist, but if you want to be a pacifist, I honor that. Um, 
but you can't you can't do that while at the same time sucking all of the emotional reality out of what we're commemorating here. And whether or not you're on the red poppy or the or the white poppy side, I think we need to start getting real brutal with generations again, get about what the reality of those wars were and were about. And I actually think you're quite right that as the kids get older, we can be more sophisticated in our understanding and our are getting into the reasons why 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 World War One and World War Two happened, and why there were conscription crises and all that sort of stuff. I mean, why do Canada Canadians felt compelled to do this out of duty or honor? I think we can be more sophisticated in our in our historical teaching, but we can't we can't fail to convey the horror of history here. And I think that what we're what we're starting to do is we're failing to convey horror because we're uncomfortable with that emotion. Well, horror is not nice. Horror is not nice. And we're starting to see the consequences of that failure to convey horror on the streets. You know, when I was, I sh God, I'm going to laugh telling the story and I don't want people to think I'm making fun of Remembrance Day, but I, I laugh at the absurdity of it. But let me tell you, and your husband, I've, I've, I've spoken with, with Alex before. He'll get a kick out of this. I don't know if I ever told him the story. I think he and I had the same kind of Remembrance Day ceremonies. Uh, yeah. your, your husband's a couple of years older than me, so he's probably born late 70s. Yeah. yeah I was early 80s, right? So... In that generation, we still had a lot of World War II veterans who were not only alive, but they were healthy. That's like right. they were maybe reasonably retired, golfing more, but they were, they my were out and about. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. Yeah. He could tell me stories of the Navy. So here I am at, a, at an elementary school in suburban Toronto. And uh, we don't have a veteran show up that year for whatever reason. Maybe he was ill. One of our older teachers, one of the SPED teachers, special ed, uh, she agrees to do step in and, and do a talk instead. And I remember we were all kind of like, oh, okay. And she, so we basically have an assembly. There's a bunch of us with our butts on that like threadbare school carpet where they can feel the concrete on your ass because it's like the barest strip of carpet. We're all sitting there, you know, legs crossed, looking there. I'm probably grade two or three. Mm -hmm. And just row, and row, and row, and row of us. And she gets up there. And what the hell was her name? Miss Bozveld? Something like that. She gets up and she explains that when she was a kid, she grew up in a country, uh, country called Holland. And that one day the Germans took over uh, Holland and they forced some people who they didn't like into camps and they murdered them, including Jews. And I'm like looking at my friend next to me who's Jewish. And he's like... Um, and she's just like laying it out. And she talked about how in her farm, they were hiding Jews in the barn under the hay. And a couple of Germans showed up from the local garrison and said, we've got a tip that you're hiding Jews. And the dad invites him in and says, look around. No problem. Pours him a, pours him a drink. He gives him a meal, says, Go everywhere and look around and he keep putting drinks into them. Hmm. And then the guys say, Hey, this is great. No problems here. We just need to take a look at your barn. And the dad goes, No problem. And says, Come on, older brother, come with me. We'll show we'll show these nice gentlemen the barns. And by this point, they're pretty liquored up. And they take these two Germans into the barn and they brain them with the farming implements and they bury them in the fields. And this special ed teacher, who I knew is an absolute saint because she dealt with the kids who had the worst luck, was just dispassionately describing she and her little sisters helping dig the trench out in the fields where it would be subtle because the fields had been plowed anyway, where they could bury these two guys. And then the Germans came around and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, these two guys, they came by, they looked around. And by this point, they got the Jews out of the barn, but they're like moved on to like a neighbor's house. We're like, yeah, your two guys came through here and then they stayed, they had dinner with us and we showed them the fields and they, they checked out the barn and they're like, Hey, if you guys need, you can go look through everything. And the Germans like, tossed the house again, tossed the barn, didn't find anyone and thanked them and left. And then basically the local resistance network planted the rumor that these guys had been killed by the resistance and it never got traced back to, to the farm where this teacher lived. I was like eight <laughs> sitting there, like with my legs crossed, listening to this teacher describe her dad and her brother with like a fucking trowel braining this guy, these two guys and then burying them in the fields and then plowing them over and how like the grass grew really tall there. Yeah. The, sto the stories, the real stories that get me after world war two were the stories about how the vegetables grew really tall for a couple of years in many farmers fields after the war in certain patches, in certain patches. 
Like the yeah, cabbages, never, the now, size cabbages, record size cabbages. So that was my Remembrance Day in elementary school experience. Now it's serving military personnel. Please don't show up in uniform because we don't want to overly commemorate what these white guys did in the military. I mean, the, the other through one- line throughout all three segments, Jen, is theory versus reality. And if you don't teach the reality, people get drunk on the theory, and then reality has its way in the end. You know, I, I also wonder, and I, this is a question that I would honestly pose to, say, for example, high school teachers who might be listening to this podcast, all four of you. Um, could you play Schindler's List in your class? 20 years ago, we could play Schindler's List, Schindler's, Schindler, mm, Schindler's List I watched it. and did to high school students. Are you showing Schindler's List to high school students nowadays? Is that something that you're doing? I don't know. I don't know. That's don't a good know. question. I don't it's know. It's a good question. I don't know. And I, I, I Probably can't not. answer that one. Probably not. Probably because it would be upsetting. Probably too upsetting. Anyway. Okay. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Um, That's all we like got to say subscribe. about anything. Like and subscribe. Thumbs up, everybody. We had, a, oh, we had a bit of a spicy uh, one, podcast. One, I mean, uh-huh. wrap up one point, and this is a shout out. I remember I've I've said this before in certain situations. I've tweeted this or I've advised people, someone is going to destroy their career today having the dumb take on this. It's not going to be you. Don't be that person. Next year, we've got almost a whole year to go, but to educators, principals, school administrators, and officials from coast to coast to coast, next year... Don't be the one who fucks up Remembrance Day. Just, just leave, some, leave just Remembrance Day alone. Leave play, Remembrance play, have the, some guy play taps, read in Flanders Fields, read a poem, make a couple generic comments about sacrifice. Have, Everybody have, gets goes out have, to watch. Have the kids do some art poppy work. Sticker, poppy stickers, yeah. Stick to the classics on this one. Don't be the next educator or administrator in this country to fuck up Remembrance Day. Don't, Don't be the next be Aaron you. Hobbs. Don't let it be you. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Today's podcast was brought to you by Unsmoke Canada. Now is the time to modernize Canadian laws so that adult smokers have information and access to better alternatives. By doing so, we can create lasting change. Learn more at unsmoke.ca.